CNN, YouTube debate on climate change in association with Siemens. Have you not wondered why it's so called Mother Earth? Throughout all of history, it has given birth. This bluish green ball gently floating through space has potential for life quite like no other place. It gives and it gives and has nothing to ask. To treat it with love and respect is our task. For the moment, the future we can't comprehend is the world as we know will soon come to an end. But there is still some time to undo what's been done, requiring our species to all act as one, with wind turbines turning and running on air, solar panels sourcing our sun's constant glare. We could cut our emissions and clean up with care, make it our mission to heal and repair, salvage and save for all that it's worth, secure our existence as people of Earth. Hello and welcome to our programme, the CNN YouTube debate on climate change. We are in Copenhagen in Denmark. I'm Becky Anderson, your host for the debate, and I want to let you know that this is a little different than the type of forums that most of you will have been used to seeing. I'll be moderating, but I won't be asking the questions. Through our partnership with YouTube, everyone around the globe has had a chance to be a part of this discussion. The poem we just heard came from Martin Powell in the UK. His video, one of thousands that we've received. Well, over the next hour, the questions you'll see capture the buzz of the global community, with many voted on by you, the viewers, using Google's new moderator tool. So let's get on with it, shall we, to answer those questions we've assembled a distinguished panel of environmental experts. Let's uh, meet them now. First off, a man who needs no introduction here in Copenhagen. Going to do it anyway, though. Uh, Ivo de Boer, head of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He is a man with a big, big job in charge of getting a deal done to replace the Kyoto Protocol, which is set to expire in 2012. Well, next to him is Daryl Hannah, acclaimed actress and avid advocate for the environment. A celebrity who's been front and centre on the ground for many grassroots efforts. To her left, writer Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, penned both the world is flat and hot flat and crowded. Three Pulitzer Prizes to his name, he is always provocative. And finally, our resident sceptic, Bjorn Lomberg. He wrote the book on it, so to say, uh, author of Call It, The Skeptical Environment Environmentalists, A Guide to Global Warming. All of you, we are absolutely delighted to have you and thank you all for joining us. All right. Well, thousands of videos, many questions. Let's get going. I want to kick off with our first question, which comes to us from John in Ireland. Take a look at this. My name is John from Victory and I'm from Ireland. I look outside and I see the weather changing. The rain getting worse than it ever was before. This is Ireland. I see places all over the world changing, including places I've visited, like West Bengal, which is now under threat. I want to know how seriously the leaders of the world are taking this. All right, straight to the point. John setting the scene for us. Just how important is a deal on climate change and how uh, seriously, Evo, are world leaders taking this? Actually, I didn't know the rain could get any worse in Ireland, but it, <laughs> <laughs> it seems it is. I, I think they are. I've never seen a moment in history when so many world leaders have taken an interest in this topic. We have 115 of them on the way to Copenhagen at the moment to be here on Friday and make sure that we get a strong, resounding result out of this meeting. Daryl, you impressed or unimpressed? Well, it's definitely a defining moment for politicians and world leaders to, to, to take a stand to make real change in moving beyond a fossil fuel economy into a new uh, energy independent and a new energy economy, basically. Um. You know, my own take is that uh, what happens here is certainly important. It could inspire a lot of action around the world, but um, I tend to take a more America focus. If the United States doesn't get involved with this and take the lead, I don't think we can really solve a scale problem like this. Mm. And um, right now, I think that that's still very much up in the air. Bill? Well, there's a lot of buzz, and as uh, Ivor said, 115 leaders are coming to Copenhagen. But what are they actually going to agree on? They're basically going to agree on making lots of carbon cuts, which they've agreed on for the last 18 years, and they've failed for the last 18 years. So I think we possibly want to ask, 
don't you want to do something smarter and something different that would actually work this time? Well, I want to discuss all of what you've been brought up as we move through this next hour. Not everyone, of course, though, buys the notion of man-made climate change. The issue is not black and white. Listen to what Felix from Germany has to say. Hello, everybody. I'm asking myself why people don't recognize movies like the great global warming swindle where scientists all over the world doubt that humans caused the change of our climate. Climate is changing since millions of years again and again and the mainstream media ignores scientific facts and real knowledge about the actual development. You're scaring people. You're putting them under pressure. You're making them feel guilty. Making us feel guilty. It's a good start, this discussion early, I think. For many of us, the Climate Gate email scandal is still fresh in the mind. And a lot of people remain unconvinced that this is a man-made problem. So let's nail this earlier on. Um, Bjorn, sympathetic to what Felix says? Well, I think there's some truth to what he's trying to portray. Let's just get this fixed. And I think that I speak for all four of us here. Global warming is real. It's man-made. It is an important problem. What we do need to recognize is that the incessant move to just saying there's only one solution, namely cut carbon emissions, and it's going to be expensive for you, is actually making a lot of people turn around and say, I don't want to be part of this. And that's what makes people, and we see this in polls around the world, that people are turning more skeptical. A lot of people are saying they don't believe in it. That's wrong. But I see why it's happening, and we need to move people back from that. We need to say, this is about making smart policies, not ones that won't work and that'll just cost a lot. Tom. Well, I don't think this is that complicated. Uh, the planet is enveloped in uh, a blanket of greenhouse gases. That's what keeps our, our planet nice and perfect temperature for us to inhabit it. Uh, it's made up of CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases. As we pump more in, um, it will trap more heat, um, melt more ice, raise more sea levels. We, we, we know that. Mm. What we don't know is what other feedbacks could happen, what other things could ameliorate the climate system, as the questioner says. It's very complicated. We don't know everything. When we'll hit red lines. But here's what we do know. That greenhouse gas up there that's going to trap that heat stays there for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. That means, OK, that what we're doing, if it is leading to a catastrophic outcome, once it starts, it can't be stopped. So when I see something that has some chance a high degree of irreversibility and some chance of being catastrophic, mm -hmm. what I do, I buy insurance. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's what this is all about. The, the uncertainties around climate change are not a reason not to act. They're a reason to act. Mm. Eva, just on the back of that. Agree? Well, first of all, to reassure Bjorn that he's not speaking on my behalf, um, I, th I, think that this, I think that this is a very serious issue. If I, if I were to go out in this country and buy a packet of cigarettes, it probably says on it, smoking may cause your death. May cause your death. It doesn't say will cause your death. Is that a reason to assume that smoking is, uh, is safe? I think we have an abundance of very robust scientific evidence that tells us we're in deep trouble and something has happened that, contrary to what was raised in the question, has not happened to us in the past. And we need to act on it, not in one simple way, that's what makes it so complicated, but in a multitude of ways, by looking at the lifestyles of people, by looking at how we move ourselves around, by looking at how we make the products that we like to consume. It's a complicated issue. Daryl, I'm going to come back to you, uh, and you. Uh, we've got to take a very short break, um, but we will, I promise, come back. We are right back. Up next, we'll meet the winners of the Raise Your Voice contest, which had more than 7 million page and video views, plus more of your questions and videos. Here's one of the more creative ones that uh, came our way. carros aumentar indiscriminadamente. O consumo excessivo e desnecessário foi incentivado. Continuarmos produzindo e desperdiçando tanto lixo. Se as pessoas continuarem a ser tão coniventes. E os governos mantiverem os olhos fechados. O que gostaríamos de perguntar para vocês é... Por que não começar a mudar agora? 
This is the CNN YouTube debate on climate change. I'm Becky Anderson, and the video that you just saw came from Brazil. The director, Bruno, was one of the winners of the Raise Your Voice contest on YouTube, as selected by the global community. And he is in the audience with us here in Copenhagen. So let's uh, give him a hand. Thank you once again, Bruno. And we will... Uh, meet uh, some of the other winners a little later <coughs> in this show. Well, our questions have come in in more than 15 languages. Our next one comes from Gaelic in France, and he's raised the issue of accountability. Let's listen him. Étant donné que certains pays qui ont ratifié le, le protocole de Kyoto et qui n'ont pas respecté leurs engagements n'ont pas été sanctionnés, je me demandais si, dans le cadre des accords qui allaient être signés éventuellement à Copenhague, il y allait avoir des sanctions qui allaient être prévues euh, dans cet effet, sinon ça ne sert à rien de signer des accords s'ils si n'ont pas respecté. So what? Well, an interesting point he makes. What happens if countries simply balk at uh, meeting their targets and will they be punished is essentially what he is asking. We have spoken about this over the past couple of weeks in Copenhagen, you and, and me. Internationally enforceable agreements, I mean, you admitted they're almost impossible to nail down. So how would the world, Evo, police any agreement? Well, the first thing I think is incredibly important is, is, is moral policing. Um, in the clip we saw just now, it was said that, that um, people do what the governments want, um, but I hope that governments do what the people want. And I think if we get a clear signal that people want to see action on this, then governments will be held morally accountable. Yes, of course, in legal terms, you can do things in an international agreement to safeguard that it's, that it's implemented. In the case of Kyoto, if you fail to meet your target, you get a 30% penalty next time around. But at the end of the day, you see very few wanted posters for prime ministers and presidents hanging at airports uh, because they have not met an international obligation. Everybody, is that, is that good enough, though? Anybody? I think there should be sanctions. Uh, I mean, if people don't meet the, if there should be a legally binding agreement, mm. and if not, there should be sanctions because I'm afraid that people won't mitigate their 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 carbon. I think you really. Um, I, I just don't see a mechanism that we could do that, mm. though. Quite, quite, quite honestly, I'd like to see it be much more of a competition. Um, and I would like to see my country take the lead in that competition. You know, in the Cold War, Becky, we had, we had a space race. Mm -hmm. Who could be the first to put a man on the moon? Mm -hmm. uh, only two countries were involved, and only, only one could win. I think what we need now is the Earth race. Um, uh, which country can be the first to invent the most green technology so men and women can stay here on Earth? Okay, and I want to see America competing against China, China trying to beat Japan, Japan trying to beat Russia, Russia trying to beat Brazil. I think we'll get there a lot faster mm -hmm. than trying to have an international court saying you violated your CO2 emissions. Beyond. And, and that, that would be really cool if we could do that. But the problem is, it was exciting to go to the moon, but essentially, we're not promising anything new. If we manage to get cheap energy from renewables, we'll have achieved exactly what we already have. That's why it's so hard. Essentially, we this... We, we have? We, I mean, we, emissions-free energy? Do we yeah, have no, that? No, we now? don't have that, but we do have the energy, and that's what people see. The point here is to say we're all sort of igne uh, igne neglecting sorry, the, the, the elephant in the room. The point that as long as this is incredibly expensive, we're not going to do it. But Bjorn, how do things get less expensive? They get them by moving down the cost, yes. volume, manufacturing, no. learning curve by no. big countries. Wait a minute, that's what happened to your cell phone? That's what happened to your laptop? That's what's already happening to solar? Oh, oh, that's okay. what's already happening Great. to wind? Great. And Tom, did you see anyone support your cell phone or support your computer? No, the point was we supported their research and development into those products until they were so cheap that everybody wanted yeah, to support them. People support coal, they support nuclear, they support... Uh, um, Don't forget, uh, the guys, this is Gailey's question about policing. They, they, they it's a question about policing. Fuels. Let's just take the same subsidies that the dirty fuels give and give them to the clean but fuels. Let's just, yeah. Sorry, I just need to say... <laughs> But it's a very, very popular argument, but uh, let's come off the high horse and realize the $130 billion that we give in subsidies are not given in the West. They're in, uh, given in many poor countries basically to support people who have $1 a day or less. Now, you can say all you want, oh, we shouldn't be doing that, but it's not going to happen. Let's be honest and say this is about investing in research and development that we can do that's much cheaper and that will actually work for Is he right change. or wrong, Evo? I think he's right that we need to, to invest in, in research and development. But I think that Tom is also right that we need to create the right policy environment that will allow the, allow the technologies that we need to emerge into a market. 
We're going to have to take a very short break at this point, but uh, stick with us ahead. The uh, story from the developing world and what global warming will really mean there. But before we go to the break, Archbishop Desmond Tutu got onto YouTube to speak on behalf of those at risk. All scientific prognoses show that the continent of Africa will be severely hit if we do not act now. The consequences could be conflicts and instability, which are things we must avoid at any price. Well, you're back with the CNN YouTube debate on climate change. I'm Becky Anderson in Copenhagen. Well, at the very heart of this debate is the division between nations, rich against poor, polluters versus the polluted. Well, our next question comes from Oli Washola, a Nigerian based in Morocco. Here is my question. Uh, how many African leaders were invited to come again since this issue is not just a matter of the world leaders or the advanced country alone. It's the matter that, that affects every one of us. My second question is, uh, what can Africa themselves do to, to make sure this problem will not happen? All right. Well, to help us answer that question, let's bring in a very special panellist. Joining us from Geneva in Switzerland, the former UN Secretary General and Nobel Peace Prize winner Kofi Annan. You are more than welcome, sir. You head up one of the uh, foremost think tanks, of course, on uh, global warming. You heard the question, does Africa have a loud enough voice? No, Africa doesn't. But I, I don't think the voice should be Africa's alone. We are all in this together. What is clear is that um, uh, Africa and the least developed countries, which are not so much responsible for the problem of climate change, bear the greatest uh, blunt. And we hope that as we come together in Copenhagen, we will all understand that we are in the same boat. And in the case of Africa, there's also another point that we need to bear in mind, the question of equity and justice. If indeed these countries are not responsible for, uh, for the vast part of the problem we are facing, we do have some responsibility towards them. Has or is Africa doing enough for itself at this point? I think uh, some African countries are doing enough trying to make sure that they replant re forest, they stop uh, extension of deserts. They are now st struggling to find the rice seeds, the drought resistances that will help them. And they are very conscious of the impact of climate change on development and, so, and, and, and are aware that if they don't take measures, it will roll back even the gains they have made. Stay with us a moment, Mr. Anand. Let me um, move us on just a little uh, bit here, because this next video comes from Minar Pimpel, who currently leads the UN Millennium Campaign's work in Southeast Asia. Here is his question. Climate change crisis has hit the hardest, the most vulnerable and the poorest people in the world. I am at present in one of such countries, Bangladesh. We believe that the climate crisis and eradication of poverty go hand in hand. What do you think that the world leaders should do so that we have a just deal in Copenhagen which integrates the eradication of poverty, achievement of Millennium Development Goals in terms of dealing with the climate crisis? Well, people like Pimpel are demanding action. The question is, are they getting it? Mr. Anand. I don't think we are, we are getting it yet but it ought to be possible if the political will is there. Uh, wh what we have to be careful here is that lots of big sums are being talked about in Copenhagen to help the poor countries uh, in, adap in mitigation, adaptation, and allow them to permit transfer of green technology. Are you happy or disappointed with what's being no, done? No, I'm saying no, I'm not happy. Lots of promises have been made which have not been kept, and only promises kept are promises which matter. Mm. Uh, the countries themselves are trying. We see it all around the world, but they need help. Mm. I don't think enough is being done. 
And with that, we're going to leave it there, Mr. Alarm. We thank you very much indeed for joining us, uh, panellists. Uh, uh, viewers and the audience, we're going to take a very short break at this point. Up next, we tackle the testy subject of greed. Individual greed, corporate greed, even national greed. But before that, let's take a look at another top-rated Google moderator video as chosen by you, the viewers. Welcome back. Now, if there is to be any real momentum to come from the climate change debate, it will require change. Change in behaviour, change in lifestyle, and as the next video points out, possibly a change in human nature. Listen to this. Hi, my name is uh, Bjarne. I am from the Netherlands. Uh, first off, I have to say that uh, I'm really glad that uh, finally something is happening. And people are taking action uh, but what worries me uh, is what is exactly the underlying uh, cause the root cause of all that is happening uh, right now uh, obviously the environment is a huge problem we're facing uh, but it's not the only problem right now uh, there's also a lot of economical and uh, social problems for instance on our planet and to me it seems that all these uh, issues have uh, an underlying factor uh, namely our human uh, greed our, our, our selfishness um, and if that is the root cause of all that is happening nowadays then how are we going to tackle that that is my question that was his question, Bjarne, from the Netherlands. Uh, Thomas, there is no shortage of uh, passion among our contributors. What do you make, uh, what do you do about the fact that money remains the primary motivator for the broader society? You make it work for you, Becky. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only one thing um, uh, as big as Mother Nature, and that's Father Greed. Um, and the problem is, Father Greed has really been driving. Uh, the extractive industries, uh, the, the dirty fuels. Mm -hmm. And to me, the way you get big change in the world is you get the big players to do the right thing mm -hmm. for the wrong reasons, all right? That's greed, all right? Um, get the uh, uh, companies who have been, you know, getting rich doing the wrong things, incentivize companies to get rich doing the right things. That's what gives you scale. General Electric, Walmart, okay? Mm -hmm. Some of the biggest companies in America today are finding a way to get rich doing the right things. Remember, pollution is waste. Mm. And when you eliminate waste, you eliminate costs, profits go up, shareholders benefit. That's see, a very powerful engine. Daryl, do you see enough being done? Well, in America, we're so conditioned to be consumers. I think that it would be a great thing if we learned to be producers again, you know? It seems our fatal flaw is this desire for instant gratification. And, and if we can, you know, change our psyche and, and think of ourselves as, as producers so that we can export mm. green technologies and, and be the leaders once but again. This, because this is about competition at the end of the day, isn't it? It can well, be. Mm. <laughs> well, listen, this would be wonderful if this was just going to work. But let's just be honest. When you ask people how much are they willing to pay for these things, they're not willing to pay very much. So it's fine to cut the first 5%, and I totally agree mm. with Tom. That you can do. But you cannot fundamentally change the engine that's brought growth for several centuries with just a flick of the hand and say, all right, now we're just going to tax these industries. Because remember, it's not the industries that are going to be paying. It's the consumers, and they don't want that. What we need is, again, the technology that will drive this. Unless we, don't, we, unless we have that, we're just putting the cart in front of the horse. Eva, you're shaking your head. Well, I don't think it's fair to talk about a flick of the switch as though all of this is going to happen to have to happen by, by next Monday. This is a laborious process. And, it, and it, it, there are two sides to it. In, in India, there are 400 million people who don't even have access to electricity. They can't switch off the light they haven't got. And they're probably saying, get greedy now. So how can you get people, these people, to grow their lives, grow their economies in a way that is more sustainable? Mm -hmm. And the other side of the equation is how can you get people that, that are wealthy, that are affluent at the moment, to, to live their lives in a much more sustainable way? And there I think technology is critical, and technology will only come if policies and prices drive that into the market. All right, well, let's 
talk about that next because uh, we're going to get to the United States, a pivotal player in any climate change conversation and a nation that prides itself on individual liberty. Sean's video, one of the most highly viewed and top ranked, according to the Google moderator, questions the validity of a global carbon tax. Sean's question. Howdy, YouTube. Howdy, world. My name is Sean. Uh, um, my name is Sean. 29 years old. Everything that I've seen so far with your treaty deals more on the level of the ordinary person and what they have to do to stop global warming. And my question to you is why has it never been the giant corporations who put these chemicals into the atmosphere, who pollute the lakes and who pollute the rivers and the air? And from what we can even tell with global warming, especially since all these emails just got exposed, 10,000 emails plus exposed showing how they've been doctoring their numbers and we can see how they've been wording things certain ways to make it, uh, to make it appealable for their viewpoint. My question to you is why, why taxes are the answer? That's, that's my question. Why are taxes the answer and why is it us, the little guys, have to pay those? Thank you. Uh, COP15, and uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, God bless, and, and let's, you know, let's save the earth, but, you know, I don't think you need to tax us to do it, so. Makes it pretty obvious <laughs> what he does and doesn't want there. Thomas. Well, what I'd say to Sean is um, uh, if you don't think that uh, your gasoline price being set by the world's biggest cartel for the last 35 years isn't a tax, then you're not paying attention, okay? <laughs> so if I want to put a tax on, t on, on gasoline in America mm -hmm. to stimulate uh, movements to smaller, more fuel-efficient cars, yeah, that's a tax, sure. Mm -hmm. But i like my taxes to go to my treasury to pay for U.S. schools, U.S. hospitals, U.S. roads, U.S. research. It's a little tick I have. Mm -hmm. I don't like my taxes to go to pay for some of the most authoritarian regimes in the world who have drawn a bullseye on my back. So if you don't think you're paying a tax already, you're not paying attention. It's where the tax goes to which treasury. I know you don't even buy a carbon tax, do you? Why not when you hear what uh, uh, Thomas is saying? I would agree, and every economist, uh, climate economist would agree that we do need a carbon tax, but we should just not fool ourselves. That's not enough to drive the, a revolution. It's it a good might, start, surely, it, isn't it? It might actually fund, the, uh, uh, fund, for instance, research and development, but a, a $7 carbon tax, which is going to translate into $6 per, per gasoline, uh, sorry, six cents per ga uh, gallon of gasoline, it's just not going to make it. Of course, if we really try hard, we might actually see people switch off like Sean and say, I'm not going to pay for that. And so what we do need, we're not going to get the huge carbon taxes that people would like to see. What we will need is to get the better technology that will enable us to actually have, for instance, uh, uh, electric cars or other things that don't pollute in the long run. Eva, I know it's been a long couple of weeks. <laughs> You're shaking your head again. <laughs> uh, what Bjorn's saying, why? Well, I mean, if, if, if Bjorn is, is advocating a tax, it's probably because he knows it's never going to happen. Uh, because there would be massive resistance against it. I think, I think that the video was actually absolutely right. It's a matter of, this, of finding a mechanism that gets the big polluters to pay for polluting. What is that mechanism, though? Well, I, th I think that that is... Actually, I'm, I'm not a great advocate of taxes, but I'm, I'm not an economist. Uh, I do pay tax. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm much more an advocate of a, of a, of a cap-and-trade approach, whereby you say to a company, if you want to make something for consumers, fine, but you're going to have to clean up your own mess after you uh, and, and buy the right to pollute. I'm going to take a very short break. Stay with me. Audience, stick with us. Let's take that break. Up next, another winner. And a question from Pirate Steve. Now, you will not want to miss this, I promise you. There are many ways to address climate change, but concrete solutions must be plotted out. It has been weeks after typhoons on Doi and Piping had struck Manila and other areas in Luzon. Currently, the Philippine government and the families affected are still recovering from this calamity. The tropical typhoon on Doi, which stormed us last September, killed more than 300 residents, relocated thousands of families to safer places, and damaged millions of dollars of properties. Lessons can be learned from its natural impact. Had a suitable preventive measure be placed during the Ondoy tragedy, catastrophic effects could have been reduced. I am Paul Darwin Garilao, a Filipino environmental advocate from Hawaii. 
I'm Alfonso Arioste, an environmental enthusiast from Manila. Wherever you are part of the world, be it in a developed country or a developing country, let us translate our small voices into actions to reduce the impact of climate change in our respective country. There's no more time for finger pointing. We should focus now on solution seeking and implement protocols that will protect us from the detrimental threat of climate change. And that video from our second set of winners, Alfonso and Paul, were actually among the first people to submit a video onto our YouTube site. And according to you, the viewers, one of the best. So thank you both very much indeed. Well, our next ambition is also from the Philippines. Paula has a question, and it deals with a certain eco-unfriendly material. Good day. This is Paula Regina Ko, a college student and environment advocate from Manila, Philippines. Since remarkable effects start from small beginnings, and styrofoam products are known to cause long-term detrimental effects on the environment, I'd like to ask our global leaders if they are willing to take actions against the use of such materials, and if they are, what particular actions or steps are they going to initiate regarding this matter? Thank you. And perhaps we should be asking ourselves what sort of decisions can we make in our everyday lives? I know you've made many. I think everybody needs to do their part, and I think probably the best way is to really l look at your own lifestyle and try to live uh, by example. And I, I think that's the, the, the most compelling thing that anybody can do. What have you been doing? Talk us through what you've done in the past. I, I don't use petroleum, for one thing. Haven't used petroleum for a number of years. Um, make sure that my uh, that my fuel is all made from responsible resources as well, waste grease and things like that. I've been on solar power for about uh, 19 years now. Um, I think we should put solar panels on the White House. You know, <laughs> start setting an example <laughs> right in our our, our mm. seat of government. Um, um, I, 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 have, I have, you know, a, grow a lot of my own food, grey water mm. systems, right. composting toilets, the whole thing, you know. Right. Our next video comes to us from Pirate Steve in the UK, and brace yourself for this. Hi, I'm Steve from the UK, and here's my video about climate change and how we can all help and hopefully get a message across to the big government official world leader people and see what they have to say about it all. Because they, they're the ones flying around everywhere and their carbon footprints. What's all that about? Why don't you just use the internet? It'd be a lot safer and cheaper way to travel. And they wouldn't be spending all our taxpayers' money flying around all over the place, would they? I hope you enjoy the video. Does climate change affect you or me? Polar ice caps melting and the rising of the sea. I don't want the next generation to see the earth die and to look up in the air and see no birds fly. Leaders of the world, Listen to what I have to say. You drive around in your fancy cars and go flying everywhere, leaving carbon footprints high up in the air. It's one wall for you and one wall for us. You should practice what you preach and stop annoying all of us. This is what it's all about, saving the environment and everything. Look at this awesome tree. The birds in the air, the fishes in the sea, all together, one, two, three. I don't know, I was trying to make a line, but it didn't really work. But yeah, together we could beat climate change. Peace, love, unity, respect. <laughs> Brilliantly done. <laughs> well, creative, some might say a little odd, of course, but he has got a point there. The idea of the CNN YouTube debate was to give people a voice, and there are millions of people around the world who feel disenfranchised. So, to borrow his line, how do we make this real? Evo, you're called the Flying Dutchman. You've been around the world a number of times over the past few years, banging the environmental drum, as it were. Since we've been around here in Copenhagen, and there's been an awful lot of uh, people in this building. There are an awful lot of people outside, NGOs who simply can't get in. And then there are millions of people who simply aren't getting their voices heard. What's going on? Well, just this week alone, I think I've, I've received about two million signatures of people that feel something needs to be happening here. And you're right, there is a, a huge and growing consensus out there that finally leaders need to do something here. And I think that that, is, that voice is really, really important. One of, the, one of the first conversations I had was 
with an Indian Minister of Environment who said, you know, the people that elected me aren't worried about climate change, they're worried about where their next meal is going to come from. So for me to be brave on climate change, they need to understand that this is an issue. And, and that is where this expression of public opinion is so mm. important. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, I think Ivor is uh, the right point in saying we also need to recognize that three quarters of this planet lacks the very basic necessities. I mean, my God, mm. they're living in the medieval world in many ways. Certainly the, the only way we can understand it, the lack basic amenities like clean drinking water, sanitation, easily curable infectious diseases, no education, all these things. And so we got to keep asking ourselves, are we looking in the right direction if we're talking about cutting carbon emission as a way to help them? This doesn't mean that we shouldn't also fix climate change, but we should be very mindful of the fact that whenever we spend money on climate change, of course, we end up not spending it on other areas. And well, we saw that. That very much depends, because if you invest in mitigating climate change and you drive the price of distributed solar energy down, distributed wind power down, every problem Bjorn referred to is an energy problem. A school that has no light, that's an energy problem. Mm. Uh, a, a clinic in, in, in remote you know, part of Africa that doesn't have the capacity to refrigerate medicine, that's an energy problem. Talk. These are all energy problems. And if we, mm. the developed country, take the lead in driving down the cost, of low-cost distributed energy, we are solving both problems. I am no, hearing Tom, what you're saying, guys. No, no, hang on a minute, guys, because Steve's uh, point was simply this. People feel disenfranchised. How do we get them more involved? There are politicians and negotiators in this building this week, but there weren't an awful lot of people. Tom. Well, you know, this is a uniquely difficult leadership problem. We're trying to mitigate a gas you can't see, touch, or smell mm. that will probably will likely affect our children and unborn grandchildren. Very hard. Uh, for politicians to respond to that. Mm -hmm. And people say we need better leaders. We also need better citizens. How do we get civil rights in America? How did we get uh, women's rights in America? Millions of people took to the streets. Politicians espied them and said, I must respond. Mm -hmm. Well, we need millions of people to take to the streets to say, I want a carbon tax. Wow. I want cap and trade. We want better citizens? I would, I would assume that we actually want to make sure that we listen to the problems people actually have. I'm happy that we're worried about Disease global warming. Disease is not a problem? But, uh, no, uh, that's uh, a exactly. Let him finish, Tom. Let him finish. Let him finish. finish. Let him finish. We're not listening to that issue here. You're essentially saying we should have people who are much more worried about energy, who's much more worried about global warming. I understand that three quarters of this planet is much more, much more worried about next week. Yeah, but you get through next week by having cheap power, okay? No, right. You don't just get through next week just by saying, I need to get through next week. <laughs> 1.5 billion week people if you don't can, even if, have energy. I know, and, and then, that's how we get it to them. Let, let, we get it wait. to them by getting the There's price another, down. The, the two more voices here. There already there already is a, I think there generated. already is a huge There's building a global solution. movement to a demand ener energy justice, but I, I, I don't understand how we get leaders not to take care of special interest needs mm -hmm. and to, to really take care, look after people and all other species and all the other forms of life. Can you answer that? Do you have an answer for that? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, I know, you know, you know what the one thing that every leader needs? Followers. Mm. Uh, without followers, you can't be a leader. And I think that what the, the leaders coming to this conference need to know, and it goes to the disenfranchised point, they need to know that people are behind them. They need to know that they have backing to be brave here. There were 100,000 people in the streets just the other day with mamas, with babies and strollers and everything demanding climate justice. And with that, we're going to have to take a very short break. Hold on, guys. Still Ed, where are we heading and what do we do? That is up for debate. First, though, a message from action superstar Jet Li. Citizen of the world, we need to do something to protect Earth. We cannot just give the money to next generation. We need to work together. Billions, billions of people. Everybody do a little bit to protect our family. Who is our family? Of course, it's the Earth. I'm waiting for you. Join us. Change is happening. 
<laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic. We've got one final question uh, coming from Jacob in Malaysia today. Like him, it is short and it is sweet. Hi, my name is Jacob Mann. I'm 12 years old and I am currently living in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And I just want to know what you plan on leaving for my generation. Evo. <laughs> I, I hope a runaway issue out of, out of control. I mm. hope that what we will see here uh, in Copenhagen is the beginning to, to not only get greenhouse gas emissions under control, but also help especially developing countries deal with the inevitable impacts uh, of climate change. So I, I would want to walk away from here with a radical turning point. Mm. Bjorn. Well, I'd like to have us tackle global warming, but unlike the last 18 years where it happened work, actually smartly by investing in research and development into green energy, but also remember all the other problems we want to do, because if we just tackle global warming, we're leaving that guy pretty short-changed. We asked uh, the audience uh, in the advertising break what they would want to ask of you guys. Limiting population growth, where does that fit into all of this, Thomas? Well, my own view on that is that um, obviously we're going to go from 6.7 billion to 9.2 billion, um, according to the UN projections, and that's really going to stress everything. Um, I don't feel like I have the right to tell anyone how many kids uh, they uh, should or should not have. But what I do feel is, coming from a, a rich, developed country, the United States of America, I have an obligation to make sure every person on this planet who wants it has the technology and education to do family planning. I think that's a moral obligation of my government. You're just back from Africa, I know, um, hot off the plane, off the red eye to come to this conference. Um, what about funding for vulnerable countries going forward? And does it worry you that funding uh, through climate change policy might actually distract from other aid that's been going in or is, or is sorely needed? I, I worry about where that funding might be directed. I'm, I've heard of an initiative that's moving forward called RED um, that could uh, potentially help preserve forests in some developing mm -hmm. countries. Uh, on the other hand, it might not protect, it might violate indigenous people's rights, people who live in the forest. Mm -hmm. It might also uh, have some confusion between uh, plantations versus actual ecosystems. And so, and you're so concerned. I'm, I'm concerned about this, the, the, where, where these monies are going and how they're going to be allocated. Tom? Uh, it is a very important point, Daryl said. If it goes from one central bank to the other and then works its way down to the forest, that's another thing. But what you see now, I was just in the Amazon in Brazil, and um, you know, uh, Brazil is really building a system uh, based on local governors, uh, local entrepreneurs, um, and local indigenous people that uh, this money, if properly channeled um, and, and, and properly um, uh, observed, I think could have a big effect in, in uh, saving the forest. You've been running this for some years now. Are you optimistic or pessimistic, Evo? I'm optimistic. I mean, you, you talked earlier about disenfranchisement. I, I think that it's clear that millions of people around the world really want to see this succeed. I think the leaders are beginning to listen and I, I think it has to happen. The Past Out has given you just a snapshot of the views and questions from the global audience. I hope you feel we've given you an opportunity to raise your voice. Let's keep that global conversation going. Remember, it is your voice that matters. Thank you to our panel for taking the time to answer uh, those questions. I'm Becky Anderson from Copenhagen. Goodbye. CNN, YouTube debate on climate change in association with Siemens.